The Triassic period was the first period of the Mesozoic era and occurred between 252 million and 201 million years ago. It followed the great mass extinction at the end of the Permian period and was a time when life outside of the oceans began to diversify. At the beginning of the Triassic, most of the continents were concentrated in the giant C-shaped supercontinent known as Pangaea. Climate was generally very dry over much of Pangaea with very hot summers and cold winters in the continental interior. The Triassic period saw the appearance not only of the first dinosaurs but also of the first true mammals. Other well-known animals that first appeared in the Triassic period include the pterosaurs, the world's first flying vertebrates and the fearsome marine reptiles known as ichthyosaurs. Many strange and fascinating creatures emerged during this period. As an example, we will briefly talk about some of them. Drepanosaurus is an extinct genus of reptile that lived during the Triassic period approximately 220 million years ago. It belongs to a group of reptiles known as Drepanosaurs, which are characterized by their unique body adaptations. The name Drepanosaurus means sickle lizard, referring to the shape of its specialized fingers. Drepanosaurus was a small reptile, estimated to be about 2 to 3 feet, 60 to 90 centimeters in length. Its most notable feature was its highly elongated, hook-shaped finger on each hand, resembling a sickle. These specialized fingers suggest that Drepanosaurus had a unique feeding behavior, possibly using its elongated fingers to extract insects or other small prey from tree bark or crevices. Longisquama is an extinct genus of reptile that lived during the late Triassic period, approximately 225 million years ago. It is known from fossil specimens found in Kyrgyzstan, Central Asia. Longisquama is particularly notable for the long, feather-like structures that extend from its back. It was classified as an early bird or a feathered dinosaur due to its feather-like structures. However, further analysis and discoveries have suggested that Longisquama is more closely related to reptiles, possibly belonging to the group called Archosauriforms, which includes crocodiles and birds. The function of the elongated structures on Longisquama's back is still a subject of debate among paleontologists. Some theories propose that these structures may have been used for display, potentially for courtship or species recognition. Others suggest that they could have provided some form of insulation or played a role in regulating body temperature. However, due to the limited fossil evidence and the absence of direct observations, the exact purpose of these structures remains uncertain. Eudiomorphodon is an extinct genus of pterosaur, a group of flying reptiles that lived during the late Triassic period, approximately 220 to 210 million years ago. It is one of the earliest known pterosaurs and is notable for its well-preserved fossil specimens. Eudiomorphodon had a wingspan of around 4 to 5 feet, 1.2 to 1.5 meters, making it a relatively small pterosaur. Its body was slender and it had long wings and a long tail. The skull of Eudiomorphodon was elongated and equipped with sharp teeth, indicating its carnivorous diet. It likely preyed on small animals such as fish and insects. It was initially classified as a species of dimorphodon, but was later recognized as a distinct genus. One interesting aspect of Eudiomorphodon is the presence of preserved pycnofibers, which are hair-like structures covering its body. These pycnofibers were likely a form of insulation or display feature and are considered to be precursors to the feathers found in later pterosaurs and birds. This finding has provided insights into the evolution of integumentary structures in flying reptiles. And now let's talk about the weirdest one. Atopodentatus is one of those strangest looking Triassic creatures that you just have to look at multiple times to understand what the heck is actually going on. It was a long and slender animal, reaching up to 3 meters in body length, with a noticeable tail and sleek torso. It didn't have much of a neck, which is striking since the rest of its body is so elongated, the neck ends in a proportionately fairly small head. It was so robust it decidedly was an aquatic animal and used this sleek body to maneuver through the water. The toes on the feet were probably covered with some sort of webbing or skin to help it paddle better through the water. Now the weirdest part of the atopodentatus is decidedly its mouth. Rather than having a normal mouth that ends in a normal shape like a normal animal, 
Atopodentitis had a wide mouth, sort of like a hammer shape with a bunch of chisel-shaped teeth in the front. In some ways, you could even call this a duckbill, but a very weird and comb-like one. As a marine reptile, it would have been covered in smooth scales, generally designed to help it move through the water. Atopodentitis was a herbivore, but a filter-feeding one. It would forage along the bottom of the seas and oceans, gathering up plant material into its mouth and using its teeth to filter out unwanted material and filter in the much-needed weeds and greenery. The wide mouth allowed it to gather in as much plant material as it could while it foraged along the seafloor. As a filter feeder, Atopodentatus would have spent much of its time grazing, sticking to shallow waters where the floor was filled with green plants and other food that it could eat. It probably would have moved its body from side to side, using its limbs to help move itself forward more forcefully and twisting its body to make turns. It probably didn't go on land at all, not even to lay eggs. Only turtles and some other living marine reptiles return to land to lay eggs. No other marine reptile seems to show this behavior, and most gave birth to life young. Atopodentatus does not seem to have adaptations for going back up onto land. It seems very highly adapted for aquatic life and probably also gave birth to life young, though there isn't much evidence either way in this regard. It is uncertain if it lived in groups and it might have been a solitary grazer rather than a family-oriented animal. Atopodentatus lived on the shores of the early Tethys Sea, as it began to grow during the Triassic, as Pangaea shifted from its former position. These habitats were mostly shallow water, where Atopodentatus could eat plants. It turns out that the original skull was crushed and the actual shape of the head is as we now know. Luckily, the rest of the body seems to have been decently preserved, so the general body shape of Atopodentatus has not changed just its ridiculous head. The general sleek body with preliminary limbs adapted for aquatic life helps to place Atopodentatus in a group with other early marine reptiles. However, this analysis is very basic and requires more support to firmly place this reptile in with other early marine reptiles of the Triassic. The Sauropterygians are a group of fairly mysterious creatures that include most of the famous marine reptiles that appeared in the Triassic. They may or may not have been closely related to turtles. As such, Atopodentatus would have been a fantastic early cousin of later weirdos like Plesiosaurs and Liopleurodon, though they wouldn't stick with the shovel filter feeding mouth idea that Atopodentatus tried out. Still, it is possible that the similarities found are just convergent evolution as many types of reptiles evolved to go back into the ocean and take advantage of new niches after the mass extinction.